name is Matthew Dulitz and I'm the Editor-in-Chief of The Neuropsychotherapist and welcome to another weekly video report. The Neuropsychotherapist is an e-magazine that's devoted to the neurobiological underpinnings of our mental well-being as well as other uh, multidisciplinary areas that inform effective therapeutic practice. We're also the home of the International Journal of Neuropsychotherapy and similar to our magazine, the journal covers areas, multidisciplinary areas that inform psychotherapy. Uh, and the mainstay is neurobiological information uh, about what's happening in our brains, in our nervous systems, that help therapists uh, do more effective therapeutic practice. Now, as usual on this show, we are going to cross down to Sydney, uh, where we have mind science extraordinaire Richard Hill to let us know what he's been finding out this week. Thanks, Richard. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to this week, what's happening from the Mind Science Institute here. Uh, Richard Hill, uh, really enjoying uh, the, the research that's coming out this week, and something came out which I thought was rather interesting, because an all too not examined uh, part of the brain because well you know out of my out of sight out of mind the insula now the insula it's interesting it's spelled both with the without the r and with the r so the insula just with i n s u l a and the insula cortex which is i n s u l a r cortex so it's who knows just spell it whenever you want you want but the insular cortex, this area, this, this fold of, of uh, cortical tissue that is folded within the brain, just in behind the temporal area, sort of down in through the middle on either side. And it's a really important area. Uh, it's to do with a lot of stuff. Um, certainly it's talked about a lot in relation to um, interception, in, in, interception, uh, uh, that sense of self-awareness, you know, where the parietal is sort of the awareness of self in space, the insular is the aware of the self and the self. So it's, it's one of the things which is interesting is it's the area that lights up when assessing the degree of pain. So it's connected to the thalamus, it's connected to the amygdala. It has a sense uh, of, of these sorts of relationships in the body and within the body, self-awareness talked about as being a part of consciousness. Um, so I made some other notes here to see if there's some other things. What have I missed? Oh yes, I love the way it's sort of. So where is it? Is it? It's. Uh, some people say it's part of the telencephalon. Some people say it's part of the temporal lobe. Some people say it's part of the limbic system. But it's tucked right in there, just behind and in the context of the temporal lobes. So very interesting in that respect. Uh, but what this paper is about, and it's from the Journal of Neurolinguistics, and uh, let me see, Alfredo Ardila and uh, company uh, have done this look at the relationship of the insula to language and language production and language relationship. Because the insula is there in direct contact with Broca's and Wernicke's further back. So the, the, the uh, anterior part to Broca's and the posterior part in relation to Wernicke's. And that gives it direct relationship to what's going on in language. And these guys did a, a meta-analysis looking for connective. I mean, we're all now looking at connections. I mean, I'm getting really excited, sort of a bit of a sidebar, but really excited about the, the activity that is caused through the brain just through waveforms, just through uh, waves being set up, through frequencies being set up. But anyway, that's another story. So for now, just looking at, and they found interesting things. They looked through, uh, they found uh, that it was to do with language production, language understanding, as we know in Broca's and, uh, uh, and in Wernicke's. Uh, there was also to do with language repetition in the supramarginal uh, gyrus, also to do with other areas. Broca's area nine, um, up in the, the left prefrontal lobe, and um, also to do with uh, Broca's area 37, which is uh, related to, to semantic associations. So in, as they say in their, their abstract, in conclusion, the insula represents a core area in language processing as it was suggested in the 19th century. Uh, Brockers, was, well, Wernicke in particular, was talking about this way back then. So have a look at that. I mean, have a look at the insula anyway. If you haven't looked for a while, go in and check it out. Really interesting stuff and worth looking at. Um, what's on? Uh, it's early days. Uh, but I think it's, uh, I'd like to mention already to, at this stage, the next 
Milton Erickson Foundation Conference. Now that's going to be in December, as it usually is. December, and this year is December 11 to 14. It's at the Hyatt Regency in Orange County in LA. And um, this is a brief therapy conference this year. It's uh, focusing around anxiety, depression, and trauma. Uh, I've uh, got a submission then, you know, fingers crossed, I get a, you know, I'll do a short course. But great friends of mine uh, uh, there, and in particular, uh, a mate of mine called Reed Wilson will be there fabulous expert in dealing with trauma and anxiety particularly. Uh, he was an enormous amount of help to me uh, as I worked with my mother when she went through the anxiety and trauma of uh, the latter years with her uh, various uh, dementias and so on and so forth. So the reason why I'm saying it is because super special price uh, up to April 25. So early bird price up to April 25. I mean, it's you know it's just like a little under half price. I'm mean, about three or four hundred bucks. You can go and get three or four days of this amazing stuff. I uh, love the Ericsson Foundation. They do great stuff. So there you go. Two things. Check out the Insula. Insula in relation to language production as well as these introspective uh, perspectives of self-awareness. And the Milton Erickson Foundation Conference in December. Get in now for a good cheap price and to make sure you have your place. Ladies and gentlemen, for now, bye-bye. Thanks, Richard. And I'll put all the links to what Richard's been talking about below this video. And now once again, we like to keep up to date with what's happening on Shrinkwrap Radio. So it's across to Dr. Dave from Shrinkwrap. Thanks. Hello, Matthew. Well, it's good to be back here once again to talk about my latest podcast with you and all of your followers around the world. It is uh, the evening here, and there's rain. I don't know if you can hear the pitter-patter of rain outside on our drain. <laughs> And I don't know if you can hear my voice that I have a cold, and I've been trying to get over this cold. It's been hanging on for a while, and a lot of different members of my family have been suffering with a very tenacious cold. So I hope you and everyone out there is in good health. And if you are, you should be grateful, particularly because my current podcast episode that I'm here to promote is all about gratitude, and it features my interview with Dr. Robert A. Emmons of the University of California at Davis, which is kind of just up the road from here, a mere three hours away or so. And I've wanted to talk to Dr. Emmons about his work in gratitude because he's maybe the preeminent researcher in that area which is, uh, falls under the umbrella of positive psychology, although he tells me that he was doing this research prior to Martin Seligman's declaration uh, of the new field, what he called a new field of positive psychology. Myself, as a humanistic psychologist, I tend to dispute the idea that it's a totally new field. But be that as it may, uh, we discussed his latest book, that is, Dr. Emmons' latest book, which is Gratitude Works, a 21-day program for creating emotional prosperity. Now, I tend to be a little skeptical of books with titles like 21-day program for creating emotional prosperity. Uh, be, you know, I'm a little jaded after all these years of being a psychologist and seeing so many things come and go. And so that kind of subtitle sometimes is a signal to me that it's going to be kind of a lightweight self-help book. I think authors often are under a lot of pressures from the publishers, though, to have that kind of component in their book. And so I want to step up quickly to say this is not a lightweight book, even though its form factor is a, it's kind of small, such as you might find out at the checkout area of your local bookstore. Uh, but it's not a lightweight book at all. As I say, Dr. Emmons is a major researcher in the area of gratitude, and he goes quite deeply into all the faucets, facets, faucets of gratitude in this book and in our discussion, and um, and also covers a lot of the research that he has done and that other people have done as well. 
So I do hope that you'll tune into the podcast, all you out there, and that maybe it'll even whet your appetite to get a copy of his book. And so I think uh, I better give this uh, cold-affected voice of mine a rest. (laughs) And with that, I'll kick it back to you, Matthew. Thank you, Dr. Dave. Well, I hope you found a few things that you'd like to follow up from our little video report. And uh, we look forward to catching up with you again next week. Goodbye.